Hey, today I'm very excited. Uh, really, I, I said to someone, I hope this message, like, like there's a message I think everybody just needs. I wish it could get downloaded to every person I know. It's this one um, because of the topic. But it's within this series we've been in called Crown Your Year. And it's based in an Old Testament uh, promise, which is in Proverbs chapter 4, that the Bible says if we gain godly wisdom, God will crown our year or crown our life. And what that just is an imagery of is this idea that God can lay like a crown on your head. He can lay his wisdom on your life, and it's just going to elevate things about your life, like royalty. Your influence will increase. Your perspective will be stronger and broader, that, that you'll have success in areas you may not have had success before because there's just a, a supernatural just favor that comes with wisdom. So my prayer is, is that your year would be crowned with wisdom. And we've been studying this idea of wisdom. And, and honestly, I personally really enjoyed it for no other reason than I need wisdom. I face a lot of decisions in, in leading the church and marriage, but I think more than anything, I need wisdom when I'm parenting. Uh, and you know, parenting is one of those things that has a lot of challenges, and our current crisis that we face is this, trying to keep all these kids fed, you know? I mean, it's just, it's not easy. The other day, I'm, I'm sitting on the couch, and I hear the, the doorbell ring. I go to the door, and there's a grocery delivery service putting groceries on our door. Now, listen, I'm thrilled we have a service that will bring groceries so I don't have to go to the store. Wonderful. I was confused in this moment, though, because I had just brought groceries the day before home. So I'm confused. So I call Kayla. I say, hey, why, why, are, why are we getting groceries? I, I just went and got And she says, oh, well, the kids told me there's no food. <laughs> now, if you have children, you know this, they will go to the refrigerator, open it, look in it, and they'll say, we don't have anything to eat. I will go to the same refrigerator, open it, and say, here's all kinds of food, hundreds of dollars of food. So the, the issue is not that we don't have anything to eat. The issue is we don't have what you want to eat. The issue, the problem is not with the supplier, it's with the consumer. And I was thinking about that this week because we have a culture that continues to grow more unwise, yet we have access to more wisdom than ever. So the issue must not be with the supplier, it must be with the consumer that we have more wisdom than ever available to us, but yet there's something about it that we are not accepting. So today's message is this. It's entitled, Are You Teachable? Are You Teachable? Wisdom is not intellect, and that's one of our foundational concepts. We think that a teachable person is an intellectual person, but it's very clear to us that intellectual, being intellectual does not mean being wise because there are many people who are intellectual that are not wise at all. As a matter of fact, um, academia, not exclusively, but can be filled with what I would call the most brilliant fools in the world. And you say, well, what do you mean? I'm talking about brilliant people who have discovered extraordinary things, but they're foolish in the fact that they can't even acknowledge the God who created the things they've discovered. It's this idea that they have intellect, but they lack wisdom. And, and, and the reality for all of us is this, is that wisdom is not just the pursuit of more knowledge, it's a dispensation in our hearts toward recognizing one God, but then also that he is the one who teaches us. Let me say it this way. You, you're gonna, teachability is not just about your aptitude, it's an attitude. It's this reality of, do I show up ready to receive from God? Am I in a position where I realize I need to receive from God? Do I see you as someone I can receive from this situation, even my mistakes? Do I live with the disposition of a learner? And I, I bring that up because this is something we need, but it should be encouraging. If you're here today and you would say, you know what, I, I'm not a good decision maker. I don't have great instincts and I have a track record of poor decisions. This is good news that you can grow to be a person of wisdom, that you don't have to get an Ivy League education or, or a graduate degree, nothing wrong with that. It's just you don't have to have that because that's not wisdom. Everyone can grow in wisdom and everyone must grow in wisdom because we are not born as wise as we need to be. So therefore we need a teachable spirit. Everyone has to, to grow in wisdom. And I can prove it to you. Uh, the Gospels account for um, the life of Jesus Christ, but only the last three years of his life. He lived 33 years, but the majority of the verses are only about um, the last three years of his life. Matter of fact, there are only 10 verses 
that account for his life from age 12 to 30. Only 10 verses out of four major books. And those 10 verses are summarized in a single verse that says this is pretty much what he spent his, his 12 to 30 doing. It's Luke 2.52, and look at what it says. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I mean, think about this. Out of everything the Holy Spirit could have included through his writers about the life of Jesus Christ for this stage of his life, they said the one thing we want you to know is he grew in wisdom. I mean, that's mind-blowing. One, that it's reality to remind us that he came like us, so he had to grow in wisdom like we do. But it also tells us he grew in wisdom. Do you know what that means? It means Jesus was teachable that he showed up to conversations ready to glean, that he showed up to moments ready to learn. It just means that he had a a disposition that was humble before people and the Lord to receive, and it's why he grew in wisdom. You see, it's also essential because um, it's God showing us that wisdom is so essential, and teachability is what precedes wisdom, that that even Jesus had to, uh, to experience it. And that's because teachability is what precedes all success. Uh, Proverbs 16 says it this way. It says, how much better to get wisdom than gold to get insight than silver? Now, when we read something like this, we have a tendency to put, you know, uh, the idea of gold in like jewelry, like it's an adornment, and it is. But when this was pinned, this was not like, oh, gold is something fancy or nice to have. Gold was the most important commodity on the planet the highest of value. And then the guy throws silver on top of it. What he, he, there were people who would have lived in this time for centuries. Gold and silver were the standard for the epitome of success. And he's saying wisdom's better than that. And, and he's saying this to people who may never have even seen gold. And so what he's saying is, is that wisdom is equal to the very thing you think that can give you everything. Gold can give you wealth and notoriety and, and influence and opportunity. And and as much as you would love to have gold, you should have wisdom more because it can give you what you want. I don't know what you want, but I know this, wisdom can give it to you. Like, like for example, if you're here and and you want a successful career, then you've got to have wisdom because wisdom will make you a good decision maker and a good decision maker in an industry that's constantly changing is invaluable. Wisdom is essential if you want to raise your family. Because you're going to face, your children are going to face things you've never faced. And if you don't have wisdom, you're not going to help them navigate it. But if you do have wisdom, you're going to preserve your peace and their future. Wisdom is essential in all relationships. I mean, there's just too many different temperaments and personalities that if you don't have wisdom, you can't discern them and connect with them. But if you have wisdom, you can have influence and be celebrated in every room that you walk into. Teachability is what precedes all success because this is what wisdom is. Wisdom is God's mind and his motive on your situation. And when God knows someone will walk into a situation and think how he thinks and do what he would do for the reasons he would do it, he trusts that person. And if God can trust you, he'll give you anything. He'll give you wealth, he'll give you notoriety, he'll give you fame, he'll give you influence, he'll give you power. God can, for people who God says, they have my heart and my head, I'll give them anything. But if you don't have wisdom, God can't trust you. And that may be why he can't give you the success that you've been pursuing. Additionally, though, teachability is what precedes all spiritual growth. Let let, let me say it this way. Um, The people who followed Jesus in scripture were called what? Disciples, right. Okay, um, the root word of disciple in the Greek is this, learner. The most common title given to Jesus in the Gospels is teacher. By the most basic definition, you can't follow Christ if you're not teachable because he's a teacher and disciples are learners. And this explains, by the way, why so many people have been Christians for years but are not different Their character's not different. Their pursuits are not different. Their spiritual maturity has not grown. Here's why. Many people have been, you can be a a, a Christian for 15, 20, 30 years and be the exact same person you were when the journey started. On the other hand, though, I know people who've only been Christians three years and they walk with great spiritual authority and insight and the difference is their teachability. Just because you wear a label doesn't mean that you are actually receiving anything. You see, time is not the key to spiritual growth. It's teachability. 
Can the Lord teach you anything? Can his leader teach you anything? Can, other, can his people teach you anything? And if you could be teachable, you can receive from him. But there's no growth outside of uh, being teachable. Now, here's what's amazing to me. If Jesus was teachable and teachability re- precedes all success and, and it's also required for all spiritual growth, why are we so unteachable? Why do we continue to make so many unwise choices despite having access to information? Here, one of the reasons is, is this. It's what explained in Isaiah 53, 6. Let me show it to you. Here's why teachability is missing in so many lives. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So let me explain this passage. This is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ. And what was, his coming, he was put on the cross, but what was put on him when he was on the cross was our sin and our iniquity. And what was that iniquity? Well, they just told us it's this rebellion in us that just wants to go our way. We want to go our way. We want to go God's way. I don't want to go your way. I don't want to go anybody else's way. I want to go my way. The word iniquity means, um, it, it, one of its definitions is to be bent in an unnatural direction, like a tree that has grown in an unnatural direction. What he's saying is there's rebellion growing in all of us, and it is bending us away from God's natural desire for us. It's bending us away. We're going our own way, rebellious way, against others, against God's way. We don't, we don't want to listen to anyone else because there's an iniquity, a sin nature in us. Now, here's, here's the thing that I, I, I think that we have to acknowledge, though, is that the most dangerous part is not that we're bent the wrong way. It's that how stealthily this happens. Think about it. Divorce rates are increasing. Addictions are increasing. Credit card debt is increasing. Yet, I don't know a single person who would say to me, I'm unteachable. How is it we're all teachable, yet we are, none of us are learning to, to not make bad decisions? It's because we don't even recognize that there's a sin nature in us. We have people who are unteachable who think they're teachable. Um, so today what I want to do is I want to give you not just, I don't, I don't want to just depend on your assessment of yourself. I, I want to give you a few things, I would call them characteristics that reveal how teachable we are. And maybe you, your eyes would be open to, to the fact maybe you're not as teachable as you think you are. For example, um, people who are unteachable experience chronic failure. The Hebrew word for wisdom in the book of Proverbs means skill. So here, here's what that means. People who are wise are skilled. And people who are skilled experience success. So it's God's will. He gives us wisdom in order for us to be successful. Listen, a follower of Jesus should experience the favor of God on the things they do. And if you are constantly experiencing failure at the things you're trying to do, something's wrong. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying we don't have setbacks. We all have setbacks. Now, life's not going to go perfect because you follow Christ. But overall, if you keep failing at something, there's a problem because it's not supposed to be that way. Like if you keep failing at marriage, loss after loss after loss, you ke- cannot keep a job, loss after loss after loss. You cannot get, uh, you, you, I mean, you, you've tried 10 schools because you keep having conflict or issues or failure. That is not the mark of a follower of Jesus. That's the mark of someone who's unteachable. Success follows the teachable. Failure follows the unteachable. And so chronic failure is a point to the, you may be unteachable. Here's another one, um, withdrawing from others. Our relationships, our friendships are an asset to us when we stand at a crossroads of decision. People who are unteachable, though, they don't lean into those, the, the asset of those relationships. They go at life alone. They pull back and make all their decisions. They don't ask for help. They don't ask for wisdom. For in their minds, unteachable people do not believe asking for help is wisdom. They believe it's a weakness. And so what they do is withdraw, and people who withdraw, people who make all their decisions, people who, who, who get in their own little kind of tunnel and only focus on what they think they should do, those people experience a lot harder life because they're unteachable. Um, another one is this, uh, refusing responsibility. The first unwise decision was in human history was Adam and Eve when they chose to step outside of God's uh, boundaries and eat from a tree that he prohibited in the Garden of Eden. And their unwise decision introduced sin to the entire human race. And so God comes to them. You can read this in Genesis 3. He comes to them and says, hey, guys, what happened? And this is their response. Eve said, the snake made me do it. And Adam said, Eve made me do it. 
the first response to unwise decisions was blaming someone else for the results. Life is not the result of what happens to you. Life is the result of how you respond to what happens to you. And teachable people recognize that, and they take responsibility for their responses to things. And unteachable people spend the rest of their life blaming circumstance and other people for what's happened to them. And here's the danger in that. When you blame is your disposition, you have given someone else the keys to your happiness. You will never be happy because you have made someone else responsible for it, and they're not actually aware that they're responsible for your happiness. Very dangerous way to live. But it's the way unteachable people live. Um, unteachable people also, this is, this is going to be a fun one, they reject correction. Um, every person, myself, we need corrected. And, and God knows that because he's a loving father, so he's put us in authority structures to give us correction, whether it's government or, or vocational or parental, uh, he, he, even spiritual. He's given us spiritual, people with spiritual authority to help correct us because we need to be corrected. Yet, there is a growing disposition in our culture that says this, you don't tell me what to do. You don't tell me what to do. I find a new place to work. I find a new place to go to church. You don't tell me what to do. Did you know in Scripture, in the book of Proverbs, that um, the way you respond to correction reveals if you're wise or a fool? And I, I really don't know how to say this any other way. If you are stubborn, obstinate, argumentative, and defensive with your spouse, with your, your parents, with your boss, with, with your pastor, with p your life group leader, with, with all the people that God has placed in you, if that's what the Bible calls you a fool. And f you, the reason I just bring that up is, is not for name calling, it's for this reason. Life's harder on fools. It's just harder. They end up enduring things they shouldn't have to endure. They end up um, suffering from things they shouldn't have to suffer from. It's just harder on fools. But yet the Bible says that when we reject correction, that's what we are. We're fools. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I really felt like God impressed upon my heart to join a coaching cohort that was being offered um, for people that are in ministry. And I was excited about it. I wanted to sharpen my skills. I wanted to get in there and, and you know, do things that would benefit us here. And so I, I, I was really excited until the end of the first session. And at the end of the first session, I thought, this is such a waste of time. And here's why. Because the material that was covered was stuff I already knew. And the, um, the people that were in the group, just being honest, they hadn't been doing this as long as I had, and many of them not to the scale that were doing it. And I just sat there and I thought, oh, my gosh, I, I'm quitting this. I, this, is, this, is, I, this is not something I need to waste my time on. And I, I remember the next morning I was kind of praying about it, and, um, and I felt like the, the Lord said, nope, you're, you're going to stay in there. And so I did what you do when the Lord tells you to do something you don't want to do is I thought I'd give him a better perspective. <laughs> I said, well, God, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I already know all this. Not only do I not know it, God, I could teach this if I needed to. Like I, and before he could let me continue, I, it, so clear, here's what I heard him say. You're not there for the content. You're there because of the condition of your heart. Turns out I wasn't as teachable as I thought I was. And the Lord just showed me hey, there's some stuff in your heart you don't see that I want to address. And you're not there for what you're learning. You're there for what I'm exercising out of you. And so you know what? I showed up every month, asked questions, and learned uh, the best I could because I saw it as not just getting intellectually stronger. I saw it as God exercising some stuff out of my heart that was there. Now listen to me. I, I want you to hear me very clearly. Te being teachable will never come natural to you. Never. Because you have a sin bent that bends towards its own way and away from God's way. And you need to recognize that and you need to attack it with the fact that you are going to intentionally put yourself in the posture of a student. You're going to knowingly foster humility. You are going to do things that fight against the bend and pull it back in God's will. And if you'll do that, you're going to become wise. And, and, and that's encouraging because the distance between you where, where you want to be and where you are is God's wisdom. But the determining factor of if you close that distance is your teachability. Because God can tell you anything, but if you can't receive it, then his wisdom cannot take effect in your life. So I'm actually, today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three exercises 
that will work out the arrogance and obstinance and that's in all of us and let you know that you are pulling back against that sin nature to, to, to maybe restart or remain teachable. Here, here's the very first one. Um, strive for a heart of submission. Now, th- th- this is my least favorite point. And here's why. Because our culture is so anti-submission. I mean, we're so anti-submission, we cheer when we're not submissive. And that's infected all of our hearts. It just has. You know, I thought about this. I can't even find a good way we use the word submit in our language. Like, think about it. Um, We submit our taxes to the IRS. (laughs) A wrestler who's losing has to submit to his opponent. Kidnappers submit their demands. I can't even figure out a way to say the word submit in a positive notion. I don't even like it. It just tastes bad even. (laughs) And yet, the Bible calls us to live a life of submission. So there's something that that the scriptures grasp about submission that we just don't get. And I think at one, it's what's at stake when we do not live submitted. A few years ago, I was preaching at a church in Augusta, Georgia, and it it was great. Everything was good. But during that time, the pastor was incredibly nervous because his people didn't know he had two missionaries, two people who'd went on a mission trip out of his church to the Sudan. And while they were there, um, civil war broke out. And he's just worried about getting these two, two ladies home. And um, so he's getting text updates, and he's talking to, to people in the government. And um, what happened is, is that people started getting kidnapped. Warring tribes began to... To, to have conflict. And so the U.S. sent out a dispatch that said, if you are in this country, stop whatever you are doing right now and get to the U.S. embassy. Now, here's what you have to understand about a U.S. embassy in another country. It's not a building. It's U.S. soil in another country. For as big as that plot is, the embassy, that's not a building the United States owns in Sudan. That's the U.S., that soil. And what the, here's what they were saying to those ladies. Drop whatever you're doing because if you want prote- protection, you need to get under a different jurisdiction. The reason unwise decisions are so destructive in your life is because when we do unwise things, we leave God's jurisdiction. And we enter back in to a world that does not reward God's wisdom and it brings destruction in our lives. And, and people who rebel against the authority structures God's put in their life, whether it's you know, their, their, their spouse, their, their parents, their boss, their, you know, any, any uh, teachers, whatever, coaches, any of that. When you rebel, what you don't realize is you're leaving God's authority structure and you've stepped out of his jurisdiction and he doesn't protect you when you're not here in your jurisdiction. And, and here, I'm gonna take it a step further. Not only do you step outside of his protection, you actually become his opponent say, what? When you pray, when, when you do not pray about things you purchase, about career moves you make, about responses in conflict, about who you date, about where you go to school, what you're saying is, God, I got this. And you know what? That's ca- in heaven, you know what that registers as? Pride. Okay? Now, here's the thing you don't recognize about pride. Pride on earth sounds an alarm for war in heaven. I'll show it to you. James 4, 6, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The word resist means battle formation. When we live in pride, heaven gets in battle formation against us. And let me just say, if you live in pride, you got no chance of winning because God can't be defeated. So instead of him being your advocate, he's now your opponent. When we live with rebellion and we live balking against the authority structures in our lives, God's God's our opponent. And I I know that, listen, I I know that's not like the, you know, a poem that's real encouraging, you know, but um, because some of you are thinking, wait, 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 I thought God loved me. Oh, he does. He loves you more than any person has ever loved you. And that's the reason he will not partner with the pride that's in you. 
in the way that a father would forcefully grab their child before they ran into traffic. Your heavenly father loves you so much, he'll fight the pride in you to keep you from following it. He's not rejecting you. He's resisting the pride in your sin nature. And he's hoping to save you from destruction is what Proverbs says. So one of the things about this we just have to recognize is when we go around and we're obstinate and arrogant and stubborn towards these, we're not practicing a heart of submission and things are not going to go well. But I love the other part of the verse that says God resists the proud, but he rewards the humble. That we, we walk in and say, God, I don't understand this fully. I don't, I don't really even like this person that much, but I'm not going to allow my responses or my actions or my words to show pride. God says, I'll give you grace. You know what grace is? It's God's supernatural ability to endure and overcome and find victory in whatever you're in. So we start by practicing a, 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 a heart of submission. I promise they get more encouraging after this one. Here's the second one. Begin learning again if you want to be teachable. For decades, the prevailing concept among doctors was this, that um, as you age, you lose your neuroplasticity. Um, that means that as you age, you lose the ability to create new synaptic connections, which basically means your brain stops growing and it starts shrinking. But in the la- latter half of the 20th century, they discovered that's not true at all. As a matter of fact, you, your brain can continue to expand. It can continue to grow uh, as long as you're alive. As a matter of fact, they tried to quantify how amazing your brain is. Your brain is about the size of a softball, and it weighs about three pounds. But here's what they quantified, that you could learn something. There's enough capacity in your brain. You could learn something every second of every minute of every hour of every day for every month of every year for 300 million years, and you wouldn't find the end of your brain's capacity to learn. That's how many synaptic connections you could continue with. Now, I, I bring that up to say I read recently, and th- this is unfortunate, that, the av- that 60% of high, co- high school graduates never read another book. They stop learning, so they also end expanding this incredible gift God's given them. And, and listen, I get it, I get it. We all say, well, I'm just so busy. Yeah, you're busy, but did you know that it only takes, uh, the average commute in America one way is 26 minutes? If you just put on an audio book, you would read a book per week. You say, ah, i, I got to use my commute. What if you put a book beside the toilet? <laughs> I mean, I've never met anybody so busy they don't go to the toilet. <laughs> this, this is why Proverbs uh, 1.5 says, the wise will hear and increase their learning. And the person, of under, it will, the person of understanding will acquire wise counsel and skill, and that's going to steer the course of them wisely and lead others to truth. I, I, I want you to think of it this way, not, learn, not learning as a, just this responsibility or just this thing you have to do. Here's the way I want you to think of learning. Learning is loving God. If you take the great commandment, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. If you take that literally, God says 25% of the way you worship me is with your mind. And and, and I can kind of prove it to you. Um, There's a guy named Al Seckel who is a visual perception expert. He did a study and um, he showed some adults a picture of a older couple embracing kind of an intimate way and said, what is this? And they said, well, that's an older couple embracing in an intimate way. I said, yeah, absolutely. He showed the same picture to a group of children and they said that picture is of nine dolphins. You say, well, but it's not. It's a picture of this couple intimately embracing. How, how, how do they see nine dolphins? Here's what the study determined, is that everything we perceive is only out of an experience or an education we've already received. So adults recognize this is a couple embracing because they have learned, seen, or experienced couples embracing. Children did not recognize that because they had never experienced it or been educated to it. Let me say it this way. You don't see it until you know it. Now take that into consideration. When you learn, you are expanding your knowledge of God. All he's created and all he's done, but when you don't learn, you are lessening what you can see that God has done. Our learning is not so we can acquire knowledge. It's so that we can appreciate the greatness of God. 
of what he's done and offered and expanded. Think of it this way. If you or I were to stand and look into a night sky, we would go, that's beautiful. If an astronomer was to look into the constellations, he would have a much greater, ex, a, a much greater um, uh, appreciation for what he sees because to see more, you have to know more. All truth is God's truth. I mean, the scripture stands above all other truth, but here's the reality. Mathematics are God's mathematics. Literature is God's literature. Art is God's art. It all comes from him. Therefore, when we take it in, we widen, expand, make larger our room to appreciate him. And when we don't learn, we never see his greatness expand in our own lives. So start learning again. Now, here's the last one. Uh, Become addicted to asking for help. Um, Did you, I don't know if you know this, children ask 125 questions a day. I knew this. I knew this. Um, Adults, six questions a day. Somewhere along the line, we've lost 119 questions. No wonder we're losing so much wisdom. Here's what Proverbs 19.20 says. Get all the advice, all the advice and instruction you can, so you'll be the rise the rest of your life. Here's what I've noticed about wise people first. Wise people ask more questions than they talk. Pretty much everybody, when they walk in a room, I think this is commonly understood. Two people walk in a room, there are two, only really two different responses. The first person says, here I am, and they talk about themselves. The other person walks in a room and goes, there you are, and they, they make you the star. Be the latter person if you want to grow in wisdom. Learn to ask more questions than you tell about your own experiences. And here's why. You've never met a person who doesn't have something significant to offer to you. Every single person you've ever come in contact with, despite their title or, or, or income level or, or where they're from, they're a miracle with life lessons and a gift of God. And if you learn to ask them questions, you draw on that for your own life. People who talk nonstop about themselves only learn about themselves. People who draw on the experience of others, those are the people who become wise. Here's the second thing I've noticed. Wise people ask for correction. Um, l- let me tell you something you may not know, but everyone, including me, has blind spots. You say, well, I knew that. Yeah, what you didn't know is we all know what yours is. <laughs> you say, you know what mine is? Yeah. Well, why haven't you told me? Because you haven't asked me to. People are fine to let you remain blind until you give them permission to offer value to your life. Here's what I've noticed. Uh, most people balk at correction. Growing people receive correction. Wise people ask for it. So I want, to, I want you to consider, are you like most people that you balk at correction? Are you growing where you go, I don't like it, but I receive it? Or are you wise where you walk in and go, hey, if you see something, you see something the way I talk, the way I act, the way I do, the decision I'm making, you see something I can do better, you let me know. Are you a wise person? And then this is the one I really want you to get. Wise people ask God about everything. Look at this verse. This is a common verse, but I think it's misread sometimes. John 16, 13. This is Jesus talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. Look at this. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into, will you help me with that phrase, all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. I'm no Greek scholar. I'm going to be upfront about that. But I think all means all. Do you know what that, the implications of that are? It means God knows as much about astrophysics as he does mercy. That he knows as much about financial markets as he does forgiveness. And it's unfortunate because many of us only approach God on spiritual matters and we never tap into the fact he has all truth. That you can ask him about anything. God, do you think I should buy this house? God, should I go on that date? Is he marriage material? How should I respond to that email? God, what will help me get access to my kid's heart? Lord, should I buy this car? Should I go to school there? What do you think about this position? God, is it time to retire? Lord, how can I reach him again? God, can you teach me how to apologize? 
God, will you help me understand? I, I really don't understand this class. All truth means all. Um, so life group season's coming up. One of our most popular, most popular life groups is marriage groups. And let me just say, if you're not in a life group, I just, geez, you make unwise decisions. <laughs> um, one of our most popular groups are marriage groups, which is, it just makes, I mean, it's just so wise. But um, one of the most popular curriculums within our marriage groups is um, by a guy who, who, whose name is Jimmy Evans. I uh, love Pastor Jimmy Evans and his teaching. He's just, I, I mean, one of the foremost on marriage. And when you see how many curriculums he's produced on marriage, you start to go, well, this guy, I mean, this guy knows marriage. This guy's brilliant. He must be, he just must have been like the best husband ever, and he's teaching the rest of us how to just catch up. But if you listen, almost to anything he says, he's going to tell you the story. He's going to say, um, I was the worst husband possible. He cheated on his uh, soon to be wife a few weeks before they're married, they still got married. And then he said, for the next two years, I was the most chauvinistic, harsh, degrading, and inattentive husband that could exist. And he says, he says, I literally destroyed the soul of my wife. She endured it for two years. She came to the end of that two years, and she said, Jimmy, I can't do this anymore. I want a divorce. And something about that really wrecked him, and he went into the other room. And this is what he said. He said, I went into the other room, and I, I broke down, and I said, God... I don't know how to be a husband. Will you teach me? And he says in that moment, all of a sudden, it's like blinders came off his eyes. He said, I'd never seen it before. And all of a sudden, I saw all the dumb things I was doing. I saw how my words were affecting her. I saw how my decisions, I saw how selfish. He said, I thought I was, she was just rebellious. And he said, and all of a sudden, I realized I was neglectful. He said, I just totally saw different. He said, it's so he said, I didn't know if my marriage would make it, but I thought, thank God, I see it now. Maybe in the next marriage. He said he got up the next morning. He said, it worked once. I'm going to pray it again. He said, God, I don't know how to be a husband. Will you teach me how to be a husband? And he followed that day, and he said, I started praying it every single day. And slowly, God put our marriage back together, and he made me into the husband that his wife, Karen, needed. Today, Jimmy and Karen Evans lead the world's largest marriage ministry. Millions of marriages have been healed. Millions. It's just a reminder that God can teach you to be a husband, but God's teaching is so profound that he can take your greatest struggle and turn it into your greatest strength if you let him. I don't know what you don't know, but God knows it. And all you got to do is ask. As a matter of fact, that's the best thing about it. If you recognize in the last few moments you're not teachable, it only takes a minute to become teachable. You know how we do it? We just ask, God, will you teach me this? I don't know how to do this. People who are teachable receive God's wisdom. And people who receive wisdom, their lives are never the same. The difference between where you are right now and the end of this year and the results you want is how much wisdom you can receive. And the determining factor on how much wisdom you're going to receive is how teachable of a heart you have. I want you to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you before we go back into worship. Man, I'm telling you, if I could download this into every single person, I wish I knew this years ago. It would have saved me so much. Would you, um, would you just bow your heads? Father, from a pastor's heart today, I'm asking you to take your word like a mirror and bring it up to our faces that we could see us. Every single one of us walk into situations, God, where we think we're one way, but then your word like a mirror shows us we, we are not the way we think we are. And so may today your word do that for us. And, and God, I'm just asking, would you craft a teachable spirit in each of us? God, there's so, much, so many dreams and desires, so many, um, so many people looking for solutions for real problems that are weighing heavy on them. And God, you, are, you know everything. But God, we can't receive it without a teachable spirit. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking for you to do that. I'm asking for stubborn, obstinate, arrogant hearts to turn to submissive, humble postures. I'm asking, Lord, for apathetic minds to become aggressive again in their learning. And I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would 
give us just the, the, the little prompting to ask. Ask you, ask you. Every day, ask. Before we purchase, before we, we date, before we marry, before we respond, before we, we move, whatever it is, ask. Because on the other side of that inquiry is all the riches of heaven. So Lord, I pray right now you'd crown their year with wisdom. But God, first, subsequent to a teachable heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.